Hi guys. Um, I suck and did not post this when I was supposed to. But I'm going to read the whole chapter now so that when you go tonight you have everything available to you to finish the chapter. And we'll have to work on it in class and then we'll finish it tonight. Okay? I'm really sorry. Okay. Chapter 3. We are on page... 47. It says, Big Tony would have preferred Stephen to become an NBA point guard. That very top of the page. Okay. Ready? Good. Still, this is right after that sentence, Big Tony would have preferred Stephen to become an NBA point guard. Still, he didn't consider Betty Boo's request unreasonable. Stephen was one of the best students in his class, and always had been. There wasn't any difficulty in Memphis finding a private school that offered a Christian education. The nation's largest private school system had sprung up in the mid-1970s in East Memphis to do just that. The problem was that Stephen wasn't the only child living in Tony's small house. Occasionally, one of the boys from Hurt Village would crash on his floor, but a few months before, a boy came to stay the night and never left. His name was Michael Orr, but everyone just called him Big Mike. Tony liked Big Mike, but he could also see that Big Mike was heading at a warped speed toward a bad end. I want you to highlight that sentence. You can pause me um, after I say this, but say, Big Mike was heading at warp speed toward a bad end. Pa pause me, highlight that, and then you can start me again. Go. Okay. Welcome back. Moving on right after that highlighted little half sentence thing. He'd just finished the ninth grade at a public school, but Tony very much doubted he'd be returning for the tenth. He seldom attended classes and showed no talent or interest in school. Big Mike was going to drop out, said Big Tony, and if he dropped out, he'd be like all his friends who dropped out, dead, in jail, or on the street selling drugs, just waiting to be dead or in jail. Tony decided that as long as he was taking Stephen out on his search for a Christian education, he should take Big Mike, too. Just a few days after he buried his mother, he put Stephen and Big Mike in the car and drove east. White Memphis had used for a great variety had used for a great variety of Christian schools. Harding Christian Academy, which had been around forever, Christian Brothers, which was Catholic and all male, and the Evangelical Christian School, known as ECS. ECS was as close to a church as a school could get. ECS wouldn't accept a kid unless both parents gave testimony of their experience of being born again. Remember we talked about that in class. And the stories better be good. Finally, and further east, and furthest east, was the Briarcrest Christian School. Briarcrest, also evangelical, was as far east as you could get and still be in Memphis. Briarcrest, more than the others, had been created to get away from Big Tony. Underline or highlight that sentence as well. Okay. From the point of view of its creators, Briarcrest was a miracle. Its founder, Wayne Allen, had been long distressed by the absence of the Bible from public schools. The white outrage over, bu over busing was a chance to do something about it. In the year after the court decision on January 24, 1973, that forced the city to deploy 1,000 buses to integrate the public schools, the parents of white children yanked more than 7,000 children out of those schools. From the ashes rose an entire spanking new private school system, the Briarcrest Christian School, originally named for the Briarcrest Baptist School, was by far the biggest. It was a system unto itself, 15 different campuses inside 15 different Baptist churches. Its initial enrollment was just, sa just shy of 3,000 children, and every last one of them was white. By the summer of 2002, Briarcrest had a handful of black students, but these tended to be like, like the black families in the fancy white neighborhoods, imports from elsewhere. The school had existed in East Memphis for nearly 30 years, and yet no one who worked there could recall a poor black person from the west side of Memphis marching through its front door to enroll his child. Big Tony was the first. All Tony knew about Briarcrest was that John Harrington was the basketball coach who had coached the, in the public schools where Tony had met him. But any doubt that the Briarcrest Christian School served up the sort of education Betty Boo had in mind was outlaid by the sight of the passage from the book of Matthew inscribed on the outside of the main building. With men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. Two very lost-looking boys at his heels, Big Tony marched beneath it and inside the building and went hunting for the new basketball coach. 
John Harrington had spent two decades coaching in the public schools and was about to begin his first year at Briarcrest. When Big Tony walked into his office unannounced, Harrington knew he couldn't do anything for him. The problem presented by Big Tony was too large for the new guy. They chatted for a few minutes, but then Harrington sent him over to see the senior coach at Briarcrest, Hugh Freeze. Freeze was only 33, and with his white blonde hair and unlined face, might have passed for even younger than he was, if he weren't so shrewd. His shrewdness, go ahead and circle that, it's going to be a vocab word. His shrewdness was right on the surface. So it had an innocent quality to it. But it was there just the same. Slow to speak and quick to notice, Hugh Freeze had the gifts of a machine politician. He was a man of God. If he hadn't been a football coach, he said, he'd have liked to have been a preacher. But he was also, very obviously, adept at getting his way on earth without any help from the Almighty. Go ahead and circle the word adept. That's going to be another vocab word. He coached at Briarcrest for eight years, taking the boys' football team to Tennessee State Championship five games in a row, and the girls' basketball team to the last seven state championship games, where they had won four of them. This year, his girls were ranked ninth in the nation. Freeze was at his desk preparing for the first day of the new school year when his secretary alerted him to the presence of someone who insisted on calling himself Big Tony. In walks this 400-pound black man with a, in a mechanic shirt with a little white name tag that says Big Tony. This huge man introduces himself as Big Tony, again, no last name, and proceeds to tell Hugh about Stephen. He told me about his son and how he wanted more for him than the school he was at, said Freeze. I told him how admirable that was, but he had to understand that it cost a lot of money to go to Briarcrest, and not everybody got in. You had to have good grades. Big Tony said he knew about the cost and the grades, but Stephen was an honor student, and he was able to pay whatever the financial aid didn't cover. Freeze gave him the financial aid forms and thought, good luck. That's when Tony said, and coach, I've also got one of Stephen's friends. He told him about Big Mike, a basketball player who, in Tony's modest opinion, might be of use to the Briarcrest football team. Where are his parents? asked Freeze. He felt a twinge of interest. If a man who weighed 400 pounds were, was referring to somebody as Big Mike, he'd like to see the size of that someone else. It's a bad deal, coach, said Tony. No dad, mom's in rehab, and pretty much all he has. Who's the guardian? asked Freeze. Who has legal authority over him? The mom. Big Tony said he could get Big Mike's mom to fill in the forms, then just sat there a bit uneasily. Finally, he asked, You want to meet them? The boys are here? Sure, right outside. Sure, said Freeze. Bring them on in. Tony went out and came back with Stephen. Hugh sized him up, almost six feet and maybe as much as 180 pounds, plenty big enough for the Briarcrest Christian School Saints football team. But where's the other one? he asked. Big Mike, come on in here. Hugh Freeze will never forget the next few seconds. He just peeks around the corner with his head down. Go ahead and underline that. He peeks around the corner with his head down. I want you to think about why that would be important. Why would we make a big deal about how he doesn't want anybody to know that he's there or that he isn't making a big deal of walking into the room. doesn't want to be noticed. Hugh didn't get a good first look. It was just a sliver of him, but it suggested an improbably large hole. Go ahead and circle the word improbably. Then Michael Orr stepped around the corner and into his office. Good God, he's a monster. The phrase shrieked inside Hugh's brain. He'd never seen anything remotely like this kid, and he'd coached against players who had gone to the NFL. When, kid, when football coaches describe their bigger players, they can sound like ranchers discussing a steer. They use words like girth and mass and trunk size. Hugh wasn't exactly sure of the exact dimensions of Big Mike. 6'5", 330 pounds, maybe. Whatever the dimensions, they couldn't do justice to the effect they created. That mass, that girth. Go ahead and circle the word girth. It's there twice. It's, it's an interesting word, so we're going to use that one. The kid's shoulders and ass were as wide as his doorway, and he'd only just turned 16. Fun fact. Boys grow until they're 21. Sometimes they keep growing. So, he's got a lot of growing to do still. How can I get their transcripts? Asked Hugh. Big Tony said he'd get he'd go get them and bring them in person. 
Then Hugh tried to make conversation with this man-child. He's talking about Michael. I couldn't get him to talk to me, he said. Not a word. He was in a shell. Go ahead and underline, he was in a shell. A few days later, Big Tony delivered the transcripts to Hugh Freeze. Stephen, as advertised, was a model student, and Briarcrest could see no reason not to supply him with a Christian education. Big Mike was another story. Hugh was a football coach, and so he tended to take an indulgent view of bad grades, but he had no pleasant category in his mind for Big Mike's. I knew it was too good to be true, he said. He sat on the transcript for two days, but he knew that eventually he'd have to hand it over to Mr. Simpson, the principal, to pass judgment. But his wheels already were spinning. Steve Simpson, like John Harrington, was new to Briarcrest. He'd spent 30 of his th 56 years working in the Memphis public school system. When you first met him, you thought that whatever happened next, it wasn't likely to be pleasant. His social manner was, like his salt and pepper hair, clipped short. He had the habit of frowning when other people would have smiled and of taking a joke seriously. But after 20 minutes, you realized that the hard surface was both thin and brittle. Beneath was a putting of sentiment and emotion. Circle the word sentiment. It's another book at word. He teared up easily and was quick to empathize. Let's circle the word empathize. When he mentioned his name to people who knew him well, they often said things like, Steve Simpson has a heart that barely fits in this building. When teachers came to Briarcrest from the public schools, they often felt liberated. Circle that word. And took a great pleasure in advertising their Christian faith. When Simpson arrived in this new place, He'd fright, he placed front and center on his desk a framed passage from the Bible that he would that he never would have placed on a public school desk, but it was special to him. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in His good works. Second Corinthians chapter nine verse eight. Still, when the file on Michael Orr from the Memphis City School System hit his desk, Simpson was frankly incredulous. The boy had a measured IQ of 80, which put him in mankind's ninth percentile. An aptitude test he had taken in the eighth grade had measured his ability to learn and ranked him in the sixth percentile. The numbers looked like misprints. In a rich white private school, under the column marked percentile, you never saw single-digit numbers. So go ahead and underline, the numbers look like misprints in a rich white private school. Under the column number, um, under the column marked percentile, you never saw single-digit numbers. Go ahead and underline that sentence. Of course, logically, you knew such people must exist. For someone to be in the 99th percentile, someone else had to be in the first. But you didn't expect to meet them at the Briarcrest Christian School. Academically, Briarcrest might not be the most ambitious school. It spent more time and energy directing its students to Jesus Christ than to Harvard. But the students all went on to college and they all had at least an average IQ. In his first nine years of school, Michael Orr had been enrolled in 11 different institutions, and that included a whole of 18 months around the age of 10 when he apparently did not attend school at all. Please underline that first sentence in that paragraph. We're on page 52, um, second paragraph on the page. It's the first sentence in his first nine years all the way through apparently did not send school, attend school at all. That sentence, underline it. Either that or the public schools were so indifferent to his presence that they had neglected to register it formally. But it was worse than that. There were schools Big Tony mentioned that did not even appear on the transcripts. Their absence might be explained by another shocking fact. The boy seldom showed up at schools where he was enrolled. Even when he received credit for attending, he was sensationally absent. Circle the word sensationally. 46 days of a single term of his first grade year, for instance. His first first grade year, that is. Michael Orr had repeated first grade. He would repeated second grade, too. And yet Memphis City Schools described these early years as the most accomplished of his academic career. They claimed that right through the fourth grade, he was performing at grade level. How could they know when, according to these transcripts, he hadn't even attended the third grade? Simpson knew what everyone who had the br even a brief brush with the Memphis Public Schools knew. They passed kids up to the next grade because they found it too much trouble to flunk them. They mentioned they functioned as an assembly line, churning out products never meant to be market tested. Underline that sentence. They functioned as an assembly line, 
churning out products never meant to be market tested. I want you to put a star right next to that sentence and we're going to talk about it in class. That's important. At several schools, Michael Orr had been given F's in reading his first term and C's a second term, which allowed him to finish the school year with what was clearly an ignoramus's D. Um, we're not going to use ignoramus in our vocab this week, but I do want you to at least underline the word because we're going to talk about it. It's a, it's a pretty, cool, pretty cool and sad word. They were giving him grades just to get rid of him, to keep the assembly line moving. And get rid of him they did. Seldom had the boy returned to the school that had passed him the year before. His previous year, in the ninth grade, he spent at a high school called Westwood. According to his transcripts, he'd missed 50 days of school. 50 days. Briarcrest had a rule that if a student missed 15 days of any class, he had to repeat the class no matter what his grade. And yet Westwood had given Michael Orr just enough Ds to move him along. Even when you threw in the B in World Geography, clearly a gift from the Westwood basketball coach who taught the class, the grade point average the boy would bring with him to Briarcrest began with a zero, 0 0.6. Underline that part of the sentence. The grade point average the boy would bring with him to Briarcrest began with a zero, 0 0.6. Another star next to that because that is vital to this story. Vital. If there was a less promising academic record, Mr. Simpson hadn't seen it. Not in three decades of working with public school students. Mr. Simpson guessed, rightly, the Briarcrest Christian School hadn't seen anything like Michael Orr either. And yet here he was, courtesy of the football coach, seated across the desk, staring hard at the floor. The boy seemed as lost as a Martian stumbling out of a crash landing. Simpson had tried to shake his hand. He didn't know how to do it, he said. I had to show him how to shake hands. Underline that. That's really important. Simpson had tried to shake his hand. All the way through, I had to show him how to shake hands. Every question Simpson asked elicited a barely audible mumble. I don't know if docile is the right word. Circle that. Simpson said later, he seemed completely intimidated by authority, almost nonverbal. That in itself, Simpson found curious. Even though Michael Orr had no business applying to Briarcrest, he showed courage just being there. It was really unusual to see a kid with those kinds of deficits that wanted an education, he said, to want to be in this environment. A lot of kids with this background wouldn't come within 200 miles of this place. Underline that whole quote from it was really unusual to see a kid with those kinds of deficits all the way to within 200 miles of this place. We're at the top of page 54. We're about to move into the first separate paragraph of the new page where it says the disposition. The disposition of Michael Orr's application to Briarcrest was Steve Simpson's decision, and normally he would have had no trouble making it. An emphatic, gusty rejection. Um, okay. Beneath the crest of the Briarcrest Christian School was the motto, decidedly academic, distinctly Christian. Michael Orr was, it seemed to Simpson, neither. But Mr. Simpson was new to the school, and this great football coach, Hugh Fries, had phoned Simpson's boss, the school president, a football fan, and made his pitch. This wasn't a thing you did for the Briarcrest football team, Fries had said. This was a thing you did because it was right. Go ahead and underline that part in italics. This wasn't a thing you did for the Briarcrest football team. This was a thing you did because it was right. We'll talk about whether or not you think it's actually, if that's what he actually means. Briarcrest was this kid's last chance. The president, in turn, had phoned Simpson and told him that if he felt right with it, he could admit the boy. Simpson thought it over and said, Sorry, there was just no chance Michael Orr could cut it in the 10th grade. The 4th grade might be a stretch for him. But the pressure from the football coach, coupled with a little twinge in his own heart, led Simpson to reject the applicant gently. There was just something about the boy's desire to be here, and I couldn't justify sending him away without any hope. He granted a single concession. If Michael Orr enrolled in a home study program based in Memphis called the Gateway Christian School and performed at a high school level for at a high level for a semester, Briarcrest would admit him in the following semester. Simpson knew there wasn't much chance Gateway would pass him and suspected he'd never hear from the football coach or Michael Orr again. He was wrong. Two months later, six weeks into the school year, his phone rang. It was Big Tony. It was a sad sight, said Big Tony. 
watching Big Mike stare at these books sent to him by the Gateway Christian School, without any ability to make heads or tails of them. Big Tony didn't have the time or the energy to work with him. Big Mike was trying so hard, but getting nowhere, and it was too late for him to enroll in a public school. What should they do now? That's when Mr. Simpson realized he made a mistake. In effect, he had removed a boy from the public school system. He tried to handle this problem the easy way, for him, and it had backfired. It was one of those things, Simpson said. I should have said, you don't qualify, and there's no chance you will ever qualify. When Big Tony called back, I thought, man, look what I've done to these people. I sent them out there with false hope. He went to the Briarcrest president, Tim Hillen, and told him what he had made a big, that he had been, blah, 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 that he had made a big mess for these people. Then he called Michael Orr, who, appear, who appeared to still be living with Big Tony, and said, We're going to take a chance on you, but you're not going to play ball. The message was delivered simultaneously to Hugh Freeze. No football, no basketball. The kid couldn't even sing in the choir until he proved to the school that he could handle the schoolwork. Michael didn't say much at all in response, but that didn't matter to Mr. Simpson. My conscience would be clear if we gave him a chance, he said. His thoughts turned to the teachers. How would he explain this mess to them? Jennifer Graves had run Briarcrest program for students with special needs for nine years. I decided early on in life, she said, that Christ was calling me to work with the kids who did not have it so easy. But her mission took on a different and less hopeful tone when, six weeks into the school year, this huge black kid was dumped in her lap. She, too, had seen the file on Big Mike that had come over from the Memphis City school system. After the transcript came the boy himself, accompanied by Mr. Simpson. He said, this is Michael Orr, and you'll be working with him, recalled Graves, and Michael didn't say a thing. His head was always down. He kept his head down and his mouth shut. And she thought, oh Lord, what have we gotten ourselves into? She knew the coaches thought that he might help their support their sport teams, but even that surprised her. He was fat, she said. I didn't see how he could move it around. We weren't real sure what we were going to do with him, and I'll bet they weren't either. After Michael left her office, she went right back to Mr. Simpson to ask what good he imagined would come from letting this child into the Briarcrest Christian School. He said, Jennifer, let's give him until Christmas. She took him around and placed him in the middle of every classroom. By sixth period of the first day, everyone knew who he was, she said, and he hadn't said a word. It was a matter of days before the reports poured in from the teachers, every last one of them asking the same question of her that she had asked of Mr. Simpson. Why had they let this kid in? Big Mike had no conception of what real school was about, she said. He'd never had, his, he'd never have his books with him, didn't speak in class, nothing. He had no academic background, no foundation at all. His transcript said he'd had algebra, but he'd obviously never laid eyes on it. Another shocking discovery. I don't know that he'd ever even held a Bible. At length, in response to an especially loud complaint from the English teacher, Graves brought Big Mike into her office. She pulled out a remedial English test and gave it to him. The first thing he was supposed to do, she recalled, was to identify parts of speech. He says, what do I do? And I say, you mark all the parts of speech. He says, I don't know them. So I say, let's start out with nouns. And he says, I don't know them. I tell him that a noun names a person, place, or thing. He says, it does? For him, English was almost like a second language. Highlight or underline from where it says, he says, what do I do? And I say, you'll mark all parts of speech. All the way to the end of that paragraph where it goes, he says, it does? For him, English was almost like a second language. Underline all of that. She noticed things about him. She noticed, for instance, that he wore the same pair of cut-off jeans every day, and he hadn't the first idea how to interact with other people. Everyone in the school knew who he was. He was the biggest human being anyone had ever seen, and they tried to engage him, but he refused to comply. One day, while she was sitting with Michael, sorting out some mess or other, her own little girls, aged six and nine, came into her office, and they just stood there with their big mouths open, with their mouths open. They'd never seen anyone who looked like that. But then Big Mike left, and my six-year-old asked, Mama, who was that? And I told her it was Big Mike. The next few days, the little girl went out of her way to find Big Mike in the school halls, just to say, Hi, Big Mike! And Big Mike just stared at her. 
The little girl came back to her mother, obviously frightened, and said, Mama, he doesn't speak to me. Graves called Big Meg into her office and explained that if he wanted to stare at the ground mutely in her presence, that was fine. And then you can start highlighting here and highlight till I tell you to stop. But when a little child tells you hello and you don't respond, you scare that little child. A few days later, Grave caught sight of Big Mike in the hallway, smiling and shaking hands with a crowd of small, odd children. Odd as in, like, odd. Like, excited and loving it, all that. You can stop highlighting right there. I wrote cute with the capital, capital letters, exclamation point, because it's adorable. Still, Michael Orr was only a few weeks into his tenure at Briarcrest Christian School before several teachers suggested he should be on his way out. Circle the word tenure. That's another vocab word. He wasn't merely failing tests. He wasn't even starting them. The only honest grade to give him in his academic subjects was a zero. And it wasn't just the academic subjects. Briarcrest offered a class in weightlifting, and Jennifer Graves had gotten, in, had gotten him into it on the assumption that it might offer him some relief from relentless failure. But if there was one class Big Mike should have been able to ace, this was it. But the weightlifting coach... The weightlifting teacher, Coach Mark Bodges, said that the boy was neglecting to even change into gym clothes. He just sat around, not lifting, not even lifting his eyes. Bodges doubled as the Briarcrest track coach, and he always had made vague plans for Big Mike to put the to put the shot for his team. Once he became academically eligible, the third time he watched Michael sit through class in street clothes, not even bothering to change into his sweats, he doubted that that would ever happen. And he jumped on him. Michael, there are a lot of people in this school waiting to see you fail, he said. Every little step you make, people are watching. This is the one class in the whole school that can help you with your grades. All you have to do is show up. And right now, you're flunking weightlifting. The situation appeared hopeless and humiliating for all concerned. Word of the new boy's various failures inevitably meet, reached Mr. Simpson, who also began to sense the dimensions of the void in the boy's life experiences. Or did, Michael Orr didn't know what an ocean was, or a bird's nest, or a tooth fairy. He couldn't very well be, caught, be taught 10th grade biology if he had no clue what was meant by the word cell, and he couldn't very well get through 10th grade English if he'd never heard of a verb or a noun. It was as if he had materialized on the planet as an overgrown 16-year-old. Go ahead and underline or highlight that sentence. It was as if he had materialized... Sorry. It was as if he had materialized on the planet as an overgrown 16-year-old. Jennifer Graves had the same misgivings. The boy reminded her of a story she had read in a psychology journal about a child who had been locked away in a closet for years. That child didn't even have tactile sense, she said, but it felt like the same sort of thing. Big Mike was a blank slate. The obvious problem, that he suffered from some learning disability, had been ruled out. Graves had called the Memphis school system and been told that Michael Orr had been tested for learning disabilities, and he had none. In short, they said, he was just stupid. By their standards, he was achieving what was expected. Highlight that sentence. In short, they said, he was just stupid. By their standards, she said, he was achieving what was expected. It was then that the Briarcrest biology teacher, Marilyn Beasley, came to Graves in despair. She said that, Michael yet give, she said that giving Michael yet another weekly biology test was pointless. Nothing came back. You've got to find out what he does and doesn't know, she said. She proposed that Gra Graves replace her in the biology class and proctor the exam, while she, Beasley, took Michael into a separate room and gave him the test verbally. The next day, Miss Beasley took him into a room and sat down beside him, test in hand. By now she, like the other teachers, knew about his academic record. She had taught at Briarcrest for 21 years and had entire classrooms of children with learning disabilities and had never experienced a student so seemingly hopeless. I had never encountered anybody at Michael's reading and comprehension level. His brain did not appear to contain any sort of intellect. As they sat down together, she noticed once again how enormous his hand seemed to be when set beside hers. She had a son who was 6'1", but compared to Mike, his hands were the, were, his hands were the hands of a child. She picked up the test and read aloud the first question from the multiple choice exam. Protozoans are classified based on a. How they get their food. B. How they reproduce. C. How they move. D. Both A and C. She waited for his answer and received nothing but a blank look. She knew the problem. Many of the words, words, words every 10th grader should know, were foreign to him. 
classified overwhelmed him. Science has its own vocabulary, she said. He didn't know it. He didn't know what a cell was, or an atom. He didn't have the foundation to figure out meanings through prefixes and suffixes. He didn't know what the prefix and suffixes were. They might as well have been Greek. The vast quantity of things he didn't know paralyzed his mind. A word at a time, she talked him through the problem. Go ahead and circle the quantity, quantity, and paralyzed. Two other vocab words. Michael, do you remember what a protozoan is? Just down the hall, Jennifer Graves waited for what she assumed would be bad news. She was already wondering about the best way to ease Big Mike out of the school. An hour later, Marilyn Beasley emerged with the wonder on her face with wonder on her face and a simple observation. He knows it. What? Jennifer, he knows the material. Or at any rate, he knew something. As he had given no sign of picking up anything, Beasley was shocked at how much he had absorbed. Go ahead and circle the word absorbed. His brain wasn't dead. He simply had no idea how to learn in a classroom. Even so, he knew enough biology to get himself a C on the test and a high D for the semester instead of an F. He wasn't yet eligible to play any sports, but Graves could see that he longed to. He missed the football season, but it was basketball he was most eager to play. She hinted that if the biology teacher the, the biology tense, test was any indication of the contents of his mind, he might well be eligible to play ball after Christmas and catch the last part of the season. The first thing he did, she, st she said, was start hanging out, hanging around the basketball court. Okay, we're going to stop there. We're at page 60, middle of the page. That's where we're going to stop for now. Uh, we will pick up the rest next time. Have a great day, everybody.